This is <coughs> just to give you a glimpse of my so-called conservatory, which is now my studio, TV studio, <laughs> for recording my videos. What a flaming heap it is. Can't use it for anything else other than my little space. I've had to import lamp in order to try and create a little bit of brightness because the sad thing about the whole situation is that although the conservatory is all glass, when you look outside and see the sunlight on the lawn, you notice the shadow in the fore part of it. And that's because the conservatory is in the shadow of the house because the sun is in the bloody front street and not the back. Hence, I can't get around the problem other than fiddle fiddle with exposure, lights and what have you. Never perfect, never perfect. The best I can do. Well by now the realisation of being at war had finally sunk in. And as a child it was something that we couldn't really comprehend because air raids and such like hadn't yet started. But the significant thing for me was the departure of my father. As I said, he was only a bandsman. He was not a trained gunner. He was in the band purely for a musical experience. Um, and it was unseemly that he was snatched away from our house and left us alone. And I remember just on the final day when he was actually going to be dispatched from the drill hall on the expedition, he came to me and said, well, Billy, I really have to reflect on this because I can never forget the words and the impact it made on me. Well, Billy, you're the man of the house now and you'll have to look after your mum and your sisters and keep them safe. And me, only 12 years of age, how frightening it was for me. It made me realise, of course, as we all did, that our protector and security was now gone. We were alone without our dad, left to look after ourselves. As I said, my dad was a musician. He was a bandsman in the territorial band and no more. He was not a trained gunner. He wasn't a soldier in the territorial army. And in addition, he had actually been graded medically as unfit due to his sight disability, a very severe sight disability. But they took him anyway, because the panic was on countrywide that all the territorials had to be combined together to form what they called the British Expeditionary Force. And consequently, my dad, along with others, were immediately sent out and shipped across to France in order to help them protect and defend their borders against the German army. The tragedy was that the German army, unbeknown to us or the world over time, had secretly over many years, particularly on the advent of Hitler, they'd been increasing the number of the forces improving and developing new weaponry, building hundreds of tanks and aeroplanes and ammunition. And of course, our troops, because we weren't prepared for war, were insignificant by comparison. And the Germans made an advance against France. But sadly, the French nation as a whole capitulated 
By that we mean that they gave in and surrendered to the Germans because they didn't want to be faced with a long battle, which they knew probably they would lose, but they just decided to capitulate and desert the English troops. And the English troops were left on their own to fight their own way back home, if possible, which was a, a devastating thing for them. And they did battle to the coastline and became what everyone knows now as the Dunkirk Retreat. With the halt order over, the German troops were once again on the advance. It would take them no more than a day and a half before they overran the beaches. Maschinen klar zum Flug gegen Dünkirchen. And it didn't take long before the Luftwaffe realized what the British were up to. We took a good hide in there. They were ready for us when we went in. On the night of the 29th of May, the soldiers aboard the destroyer HMS Wakeful thought they were safe. But the destroyer suffered one of the most prolonged aerial bombardments of the evacuation. And my dad, along with all the other English soldiers, subsequently hated the French forever for betraying them. And I can understand that quite strongly. The French deceived us, deserted us, and left us to our own ends. In the meantime, I myself had contracted the deadly disease of the diphtheria. And diphtheria, if you know, is a deadly, and for children alone, it can be a killer disease. It restricts your breathing and your swallowing. And because of that, it affects your heart rate and possibly heart failure. And I caught this serious dose and I was whipped immediately by ambulance down to what they call the isolation hospital. And of course at that time, that era, there were no handy cures for such diseases in those days. And uh, my treatment at the time was no more than having what I would call very hot medical liquid in a big steel bowl that I had to gargle with to try and help to kill the infection in my throat because breathing and swallowing for me was painful and difficult. And I had a nurse, I must mention the nurse. <coughs> I remember her name and have never yet forgotten it. Nurse Sanderson, who was an angel to me, so kind. She was my assigned nurse and used to look after me and nurse me periodically. And each time, about every three hours, she would produce what was called the gargle medication. And it had to be, if I say hot, but hot enough to bear. And um, on one day, I think I'd been in about a week in a very precarious state. And it was quite ominous that I was at risk. But nevertheless, the nurse had produced my gargle and carelessly and accidentally, whatever, she gave me the bowl of gargle and it was scalding hot, too hot, in fact, to be used. And when I put it in my mouth to, to gargle, I remember I screamed so loudly because of the intense scalding pain in my throat and the screams were heard by the ward sister who immediately dashed up to find out what the hell was the matter. 
and she admonished the nurse quickly, told her to get off the ward for stupid, stupid acts like that, and took her off duty altogether. And I was then given some coolant to try and help the situation, and I was very, very ill and very painful at the time. I thought my end had come. But you know, surprisingly, within 24 hours, I started to breathe a little easier. Not greatly, but significant to know that my condition seemed to be on the mend. And after about a week, I was almost back to normal. My throat had relaxed, the infection seemed to be reduced sufficiently, and I could swallow and get back onto ordinary meals. And poor Nurse Sanderson, I never saw again. But you know, I think, and I bless her, because I think that her mistake actually saved my life. I don't know, but I really believe that Nurse Sanderson, because of the scalding mistake that she made with my medication, she saved my life, and I shall never forget her. Following my recovery from diphtheria and my return home, and after a considerable period of time helping my mum with her service with the emergency rest centre operation, I decided to join the army cadets with the fond belief that at my age I was going to learn to be a soldier and all that mattered for my eventual call up into the army. It was great, I enjoyed it, okay. learning rifle craft, going on the range, learning how to shoot the rifle. <laughs> learning Morse code, signaling, and all sorts of things, discipline in particular. Eventually though, surprisingly, they had learned of, of my musical and band experience and they persuaded me to transfer into the band and bugles of their regiment which I did and that I liked especially nicely it was great because not only was I playing the cornet in the band but they taught me to play the drums the side drums and the bugle and various things that helped me prosper in the band. And of course I loved going on their regular recruiting parades through the township and things like that. And we also went to frequent camps, camping out and learning so much more. By this time, my dad had survived Dunkirk and returned back to England. And subsequently, he was then given his medical discharge with the apology that he shouldn't have been there in the first place. But he didn't care. He was back and free of the army. And we were joyful to have him return back to our home and give us the support and comfort of his very presence in the family once again. For many reasons, and even though I had enjoyed all my time in the Army Cadet Force, I did in fact decide to leave them and to transfer and join the Air Training Corps, the ATC, because my ambition now was hopefully to be able to join the Royal Air Force. And of course, I knew at that time that my academic qualifications were totally inadequate ever to aspire to be a pilot, but I was able to achieve the basic entrance standards for bomber crew, and in particular to be a wireless operator bomber crew, which was my true ambition. And to this end, whilst in the ATC, I targeted those topics of study which would help me to get into the Air Force, such as radio technology, Morse code, aircraft recognition, astro navigation, and others. And I thoroughly enjoyed it, and I did in fact gain my proficiency stars in the course of my period with the ATC. 
And additionally, which helped me greatly, was that my dad had previously encouraged me to take up a hobby. And the hobby actually was to build radio sets. And he encouraged me to get the necessary periodicals and books and to buy the components, valves, rheostats, condensers, you name it, in order to assemble and to build working uh, wirelesses. In fact, I did build two extra good models which actually worked, and that gave me a thrill. And I felt that that kind of practical experience and my professional experience with the ATC would boost my chances of being accepted when eventually I was called to enrol and apply to join the RAF. At the same time, and yet quite separately, both my mother and I joined the St. John's Ambulance Association, in which we received adequate training and practice and eventually became certificated first aiders, which was very useful for us and also to other people, especially while we were helping out at the emergency rest centre where the bombed out families were being received. And then we gained our second certificate and thirdly, after about 12 months, I was awarded the Gold Medallion, which is the highest award a first aider can receive. And I was thrilled a bit for that and felt very honoured. And I wore it with pride. And I felt that that award, and with those proficiency certificates I was getting from the ATC, it was finally eliminating my poor school dismal records. And I felt that I was beginning to achieve something of stature. Additionally, but finally, I had volunteered and joined the Police Cadet Messenger Service. And my duties really would begin mostly during the nighttime air raids, that when the air raid siren would sound, I'd have to jump out of bed, don my police uniform, steel helmet, jump on my bike and pedal down to the police station, which was situated at the Nook. And my duties really was to assist the constables during their patrols, but essentially to be on standby should the telephone system break down. And again, we would have to carry messages on our bike from one substation to another. By this time, the nighttime bombing raids had increased in number. We would receive about two or three bombing raids per week on average. It varied, but it was quite regular. And the targets, essentially, I believe, would be the river, because they would come up from the Tyne entrance <coughs> right up to Newcastle and seeking out the shipyards and the ships themselves in order to destroy. And also any other building that like, might look like a factory, which drew in things such as schools, hospitals, cinemas, you name it, they all became targets. And sadly, a lot of the bombs that were dropped would not be on target, but would be stray and fall into the residential areas, destroying the houses and the people within them. The school, which was at the top of our street, also became a target right early on in the air raids. And I do remember greatly sitting in the air raid shelter in the garden and hearing the bombs screaming down. And when the bombs hit the ground and exploded, we could actually feel the ground judder. And it was about 400 yards away from the house and about 300 yards away from the school. The school had been missed but it made you think that was a close one. It was terrible. Now, the police station that I was situated at, at the Nook, was only 300 yards, 400 yards away from what was an anti-aircraft uh, station. 
and a searchlight station which was situated on what was then open ground at the bottom of Prince Edward Road at the junction of King George Road. And naturally the searchlights always attracted attention from the bombers and the bombs would come down in that area. And sadly, as I say, the residential houses would become destroyed. My own experience with such my own horrifying experience and I only had one so I'm not boasting about this but I was on nighttime patrol with the police during an air raid at the nook and we were just walking around the area just watching to see that civilians and other people were taking care of themselves when we heard the, the, the planes were overhead then all of a sudden we heard the scream and the whistling of a bomb hurtling down towards us. And I thought this was it. And I remember, out of fear, pushed myself against the wall for protection. I mean, what protection could a wall protect you from? It was ridiculous. But panic set in and the screaming came down. And there was such a crump and the ground shook under your feet and now it was blown literally because of the blast the bomb dropped at the other side of the police station but the blast was such that it sucked all the air out of my lungs horrifying and blew me across the pavement onto my back but i wasn't hurt i wasn't injured but i was frightened i can tell you and i thought that was the end of my life altogether but sadly the bomb that did drop was just around the corner to the station and um, three houses were totally demolished and sadly the occupants were then also. That was my only what I call near miss but one which I'll never forget. <laughs>